Well, hello to you all. It's me, Ghost Critic. Thank you for joining me this Monday evening uh, to um, listen to me talk about comics because this is a comic book review video where I give you my thoughts, opinions, reviews of all the books that I picked up last week. For those of you who have been loyal to my channel, you'll have already watched Wednesday's video and know the books that I'm about to talk about. Um, so you've got a heads up on everybody else. Uh, just to remind anyone who's new, there are spoilers, um, so proceed with caution. And I uh, kind of review them, I give you my thoughts and opinions on them, in a kind of ascending order of how much I like them leading up to the pick of the week. Uh, before I kick off with the, the rundown or the run-up, to pick of the week. Uh, just to remind you, if you didn't watch Wednesday's video, currently taking submissions, questions for uh, my Q&A video, which will be coming up in a couple of weeks' time when I'm on holiday for my birthday. So if you've got any burning comic book questions that you'd like me to answer, down in the comment section below is where you need to stick them. And I will do my best to answer them. I'll give you a little bit of a shout out at the same time. And it's all good. It's all fun. It's all positive. Um, this week, as you can kind of guess from the title, there was a lot of confusion fusion going on in my comics. Um, not necessarily the comics themselves, but probably in my brain. Um, because there's some there's some weird stuff going on in comics. And I'm gonna kick off with the one that I least liked. Uh, and I it's it's unfortunate because it's in a writer that I'm really enjoying at the moment on other titles. Uh, but something is not right here. Astonishing X-Men, um, issue number 15. Uh, for those of you who don't quite recognise this creative team, we have changed things up from the first 12 issues. Uh, we have Matthew Rosenberg writing this now, and it appears that Greg Land is the um, featured artist on this whole story arc. <sighs> oh, well. Um... um the confusing thing about this is I don't really know where Rosenberg is going with this story. We kind of, or he's created this new team of X-Men that are basically nothing like the first one we saw. So we've now got Havoc, we've got Beast, we've got Warpath, we've got Dazzler, we've got Colossus and we've got the... Um, the re-emergence of Banshee who we all thought was on death's door and still looks like it um, and there is obviously this uneasiness between this new team because they're not really a team yet there's no particular reason for them to be together apart from the fact that Havoc has, has crossed their paths and um, We've had a kind of a, a government a, a, um, agency uh, kind of fall in their path, which they've um, had a little bit of a fight with. And there's this list where the Reavers are trying to basically knock off our mutants. And Havoc seems to have it in his head that these two bodies, uh, the government and the Reavers, are after him. And it's all to do with him siding with Bastion uh, and the kind of mutant cabal uh, that was throwing around the Mother Vine in um, X-Men Blue. Um, uh, and there's apparently now an implant in the back of his head that this is what they're all after, but they just don't realise it's with Havoc, which is why there's this big, huge list. Is it all just a kind of flim-flam, a, a redirection about what Havoc is really bringing this team together? Because there does seem to be a whole heap of line coming out of um, Alex's mouth. Um, he kind of first starts explaining that, you know, they're all after him. He brought this team together because he wanted them to protect 
him um, and it, it all just seems a little bit flimsy in the whole story take and then by the end of it you have um, Havoc wanting to team up with this uh, kind of rogue I guess uh, faction of the Reavers and, and of obviously the rest of the X-Men apart from Warpath have all been uh, captured by this government agency who you find are kind of in cahoots with the Reavers as well it's all very confusing and there probably is a really good story in here somewhere there's the nugget of one um, obviously what's putting me off as well is the Greg Land artwork I just can't deal with it it is just not my cup of tea at all. Um, I'd love to want him to make his way uh, onto another book I don't read. Um, and to go back to the format we had with the first 12 issues where uh, we had a different artist for each issue. Um, that was fun. It didn't always work, but it's not working at all for the last three issues here because it's the same artist. Um, We'll see. I'm in that stubborn rut where I'm going to keep getting this until I start crying about it. Let's move on to David Lapham's Stray Bullets, Sunshine and Roses, issue number 38, which is always confusing. Uh, when you open the first page of any given issue, you have no idea or what to expect. It is always kind of very... Um, chaotic in a, a semblance of a good way. I won't say it's chaotic and confusing in a bad way, but here we have a kind of another kind of almost digressive storyline after the big cliffhanger of issue 37 where as um, our kind of uh, our main protagonists, I can't ever remember many of their names, Beth and Orson and Nina. That's it. They're all chasing off. We've got this assassin behind them. The only way that Beth can work out how to get out of this is to basically crash the car. And that's how we ended up in the last issue where uh, the car looked a completely wreck, complete wreck and we're wondering who was survived and who was not. What this issue basically is, we have Beth in uh, the hospital, hooked up to the drips, um, all bandaged up, neck braced, the whole shebang, uh, and we're getting, I guess, her free fevered, almost, I guess, comatose reaction to this. And we go into that land of the Amy Speed Racer, I think that's her name, which is this kind of hyper sci-fi fantastical version of herself um, and all the, all the way we've had this I mean that we it's not this isn't new uh, we've dipped in and out of this but I've always felt that Amy and Beth are at least friends um, if not have this bond but in this issue Amy is out to basically kill Beth uh, for whatever reason, because again, it, it's this kind of dreamlike state which um, jumps from kind of chapter to chapter, from scenario to scenario, and there are elements of it that reflect what is going on in Beth's real life. Uh, every time she kind of gets knocked out in this dream world, she kind of realizes what's going on a little bit around her until she passes out again and she's back in the dreamland. Like I said, it's all very confusing. Um, I'd like to say this is leading up to a finale of sorts, but knowing David Lapham, there's probably another 20 issues of this to go. And now I'm not so sure. I've always said, um, you know, issue after issue, that I'm surprised, one, that this has gone on so long, given, I mean, yes, there have been iterations of Stray Bullets that have gone on for a long time, there's been a long run, but the last couple of uh, volumes have been very short, so to get this kind of <coughs> uh, long kind of saga-like uh, storyline has been fun, but it's now, I 
kind of wearing thin and you just want this story to kind of wrap up to come to a finale to to end but i just don't see that coming anytime soon but my patience is starting to wear just a little thin as much as I enjoy Lapham's work on this, as much as I appreciate the craft of storytelling that David Lapham has put into this book, come on, man, it's time to wrap it up. Let's talk about Paper Girls, issue number 24 from Brian K. Vaughan and Cliff Chang. Uh, perhaps now Brian K. Vaughan is on that year-long hiatus from Saga. Uh, he might concentrate a little bit more on Paper Girls now uh, and keep the ball rolling on this title um, and we'll get some sort of a resolution. Uh, and we all start uh, back on the confusing time travel trail. That's even harder to say than it is to work out what's going on in this book. But um, yes, we kind of jump back to a time that we've already been, which was kind of like the prehistoric times uh, that the girls fell into. And we go back to a couple of characters that were basically left there. Uh, one that belonged to that um, time era and one that certainly didn't. So we we meet back up with Dr. Quanto, Wari and her son Jaffo um, and it looks like Dr. Quanto has been kind of acclimatising herself to the era that she's in but a rescue mission has been sent and there's a craft to take her home. Uh, Wari is obviously not very happy about that and wants her to take uh, Jaffo the son with her so he can have a better life and he ends up basically take she ends up basically taking both of them uh, to a another time where they can grow up in a more civilized era and to live out their lives and who do those people turn out to be well here we are in the far flung future where some of the girls meeting this um, old woman that we saw on the cover of last issue and she is in fact Wari and we, I'm guessing we glean from this issue that her son Jaffo is um, this uh, kind of grandfather figure um, who is, is the head of this, I guess, this future city um, and, is, and is, I guess, in his own way, trying to sort everything out from all these kind of uh, different factions of people that kind of want to go back in time and pick things up and all that kind of stuff. And the other storyline going on in here is of course uh, the the revelation of Max's uh, disease uh, that she is or may not be carrying. Um, we have the had the two of them, her and Chat oh so many names KJ that's it KJ uh, break into one of these kind of futuristic hospitals because they can cure all diseases now and they take hostage one of the one of the staff members there who reveals that uh, Mac doesn't actually have leukemia at all but apparently um, has a very rare strand of cancer that only um, people catch if they are time travellers and it is of course um, untreatable so kind of there's a pro, yay, she doesn't have leukemia, but there's a con, she has this very rare untreatable cancer because time travel. Again, this is another book that feels like it's heading to a finale and that's what I would like to see for this book um, to uh, once again get the whole thing wrapped up. There are, there does, like I said, seem to be strands culminating to uh, perhaps getting these girls back to their own timelines, which for those of you who may have forgotten, that is the 80s where they came from, so they can go back to being paper girls um, and see how their lives um, fit in after all their time traveling adventures. Who knows? Um, 
But again, it's one of those books that basically takes so long to come out between issues and between story arcs, the good old image hiatuses that they have, um, that it feels like it's gone on much longer than it actually has. Uh, let's wrap this story up as well. I'm, I'd like to get some new books on, on my pull list, but I need some books to finish first, so I'm not made of money. It's time for the second issue of Peter J. Tomasi and Carlo Barbera, um, Adventures of the Super Sons. Um, one of my favourite titles from the last volume. Um, we had just Super Sons, now it's the Adventures of the... Um, and it's like they have never been away uh, as we get more of this fun, uh, vibrant, fresh youthful superhero silliness that is this book and I can just lap it up with issue after issue. Uh, the end, uh, kind of towards the end of last issue, we had the um, cliffhanger of these younger versions of many of DC's villainous characters like Lex Luthor, um, the Joker, kind of, I guess it's a kind of a Mr. Freeze kind of knockoff. Um, uh, there's a Brainiac in there, but they're all kind of like kid versions of them. Uh, but it is revealed in this issue that things are not quite what they seem, and they appear to be... I, the only way I can describe them is that they are DC's versions of Marvel Scrolls. They are basically shapeshifters. Uh, they are this alien race, which from the kind of preamble at the start, kind of showing their civilization, they seem to be predominantly um, peace loving, I guess you'd say. They're not out to conquer or, or any of that kind of stuff. But of course, there's always uh, one bad apple who will um, affect other people around them. And that's the, uh, the kind of alien being that is the Lex Luthor kid version uh, who has brought all these others with him and want to capture uh, specifically Superboy because they need to get into the Fortress of Solitude to get some sci-fi doohickey that's going to help them conquer other dimensions, other universes um, and of course they need Superboy's identity to be able to access the Fortress of Solitude which they we saw them do in the last issue. Um, the kind of little slight twist we've got in here to be going on with is the uh, the kind of shapeshifter alien that's in the guise of uh, the Joker um, is having kind of second thoughts about what's going on um, the way the team is going and decides to help Superboy and a Robin out of their current predicament um, and we kind of end on um, the use um, of this uh, kind of red kryptonite that they used to initially kind of uh, diminish Superboy's powers and help uh, defeat uh, Superboy and Robin. Um, and as Robin's playing around with it, trying to reverse the effects, it basically splits Superboy in two. And although I am not um, a kind of huge historian of Superman, but didn't we have at one point in, was it the late 90s, um, a blue and red version of Superman? So this, I'm guessing, kind of harkens back to then. Um, but as always, it's hugely uh, fun to read. The artwork by, um, by Carlos is just fun all the way, it's action packed, it's colourful, it's playful and I just love reading this book and if you just want something that's less on the serious side and more on the fun side you certainly need to be picking this up. Penultimate book of the week is Black Science by Rick Remenda and Matteo Scalera, issue number 38. Um, and we're coming to the end of this story arc. Only one more to go before this title uh, comes to a close. And I'm not... It sounds bad, but I don't really know why I've put this so high, because I 
got a clue what went on in this issue. I'm guessing it's kind of, uh, I guess, the reverse of my least, less, least liked comic, which was Astonishing X-Men, where in Astonishing X-Men, the story is there. It's just trying to find it, but the artwork is awful, in my opinion. But the artwork in here sells this book for me month after month after month. Mateus Scalera is just a fantastic artist who brings every page, every kind of environment, character to life, and I love it. Obviously, there's a damn good story going on here. I have 38 issues on. I've loved this kind of dimension hopping sci-fi um, extravaganza that has been going on from Remender's Mind. Uh, but this issue in particular, it's just like, what's going on? Um, we kind of, I don't know whether we've gone into yet another dimension, kind of uh, still trying to escape this, is it the nullification blast that's, that's tearing up all the dimensions? But we seem to have come to a dimension where our two characters... Um, Grant and uh, kind of his wife from, I think it's from another dimension, but they've kind of got together, um, Sarah. Uh, they've come to this dimension where the, the versions of them, I think, are aliens. Um, I think. I, I, I just don't know. It's so confusing, but there is the, it, it's all very kind of, very philosophically based and the meaning of life and, you know, the way that humans make the same mistakes time and time again and never learn. And at the culmination of this, this nullification blast has caught up to them yet again and is kind of destroying this whole dimension. And you think this is it now. And just as we're about to see them all disappear and be blasted. Well, our other team that have been obviously trying to catch up with Mom and Pop, uh, they've come to save the day just in the nick of time. I, I just don't know what to say um, about the kind of the story of this um, because it, it, I don't know what's going on. I don't, but... If it wasn't for Scalera, um, perhaps I would have knocked this on the head because his artwork is phenomenal. I've always said uh, uh, he's just the most fantastic artist and should be um, uh, drawing uh, so many more books uh, going on over Image. Every um, writer should be using him. Uh, flog this guy to death. Um, but... It's just one of those books that I guess you kind of really need to take it slowly and digest it um, over perhaps a number of reads to to really get your your fix on this. It, it's completely the opposite of say you know Super Sons, which is which is light and airy and easily digestible. Um, this is clearly on the other end of the comic book spectrum, which is more of a heavy material matter, which which is good to have. It kind of stretches the old brain cells of which I have few left, clearly. Um, but I like this book nonetheless. It's another strange pick of the week in the sense that it just kind of fell into that position, uh, given uh, the confusing elements of my other books. Uh, once again, if you've been watching my Wednesday comic book pull list video, you will already have worked out what my number one book is this week. Um, and it's number one again. The last issue, I'm sure, was my pick of the week. Uh, but it's issue number seven of The Avengers over at Marvel from Jason Aaron with new artist team on the book, Sarah Pacelli and Justin Ponza. Um, and this is a kind of very different book than what we've seen over the last six issues where we have the big celestial battle, uh, the final host, the team coming together as we kind of uh, go back in time to this kind of 
prehistoric BC version of the Avengers where we see I guess the origin story of the very first Ghost Rider and how he came to be. Um, and as an origin story I guess for this BC prehistoric character it's very fun and serviceable. Um, we have this small child living within a community of um, of of people, uh, of prehistoric humans, just kind of living, trying to get through their lives through this this desolate wilderness, the, a wintry wilderness. Uh, but there is something very special about this particular boy that he has to keep secret from all the rest, or they will see him as different and throw him out to fend for himself because different is bad. Uh, and that's the fact that he can actually talk in, you know, proper live sentences. You know, like what I'm doing now. Um, it's not until a, a stranger comes to this kind of cave encampment, um, which has a story, you know, he has a story to tell. And obviously he can talk as well. He is not like uh, the rest of um, this clan of kind of cavemen. Um, and there is obviously something incredibly suspect about him, um, but the little boy does not click. Um, and I guess while he is asleep or or um, distracted, um, the the horror of this uh, monster that this guy talks about uh, makes uh, its way through the clan and kills them all, leaving this poor boy alone. Uh, bloodied and uh, having to go out into the world uh, to, for survival basically uh, and comes across scary white snow monster um, who kind of in turn makes him into what he is which is this version of Ghost Rider um, at with the whole kind of the the bent the vengeance the punishment vibe going on with it um that bit was a bit kind of convenient shall we say um but it certainly leads um leads our character on his path to find out who killed all of his clan um, and obviously become this spirit of vengeance and he gets to um, ride a big woolly mammoth which is always cool. Of course the guy who come to his encampment is the monster and is in fact a wendigo um, and they have this big fight, this big battle, it's all very fun, it's all very action packed uh, it almost looks like Ghost Rider um, is going to win, but of course, the, this this, a, this element of Wendigo is evil and evil never dies. I did like the kind of um, portrayal of this early version of Ghost Rider. Um, obviously, the ones that we've seen in present day, he has his metal chains, which he uses. Well, in this prehistoric age, what is there? There's bones. So we've got this great kind of picture of him with his his chain of bones to use to um, ensnare people in. Um, so yes, as we see the Wendigo apparently plummet to his doom along with Mammoth in tow. Um, it's up to, well, Phoenix and Odin to turn up um, and uh, there's another team member for our Avengers crew uh, BC version. <coughs> like I said, it is incredibly entertaining, incredibly fun, a nice little kind of uh, back history to the kind of origins or at least this version of Marvel's origins of Ghost Rider. Um, I'm just having a whole heap of fun with an Avengers book again after being away for for so long. So for that, pick the week. Um, please let me know in the comment section down below what would have been your pick of the week. What books have you been reading? Uh, once again, don't forget to submit your questions for me to answer in a couple of weeks in my Q&A. Give this video a big thumbs up. 
if you haven't subscribed to my channel yet and you don't want to miss out on any more videos, hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell and say hi in the comments. I will reply to you all as soon as I can. Thank you all for watching. Bye-bye.